Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I love the buzz in the room. This has been pretty fantastic. Uh, huge congratulations to the students who took some time, worked together to create some of these posters. There's some very rich information here. And um, I personally like to think that if you weren't already a convert in the domestic violence and sexual assaults advocacy world that you are now, that your delving into this issue has opened for you how prevalent it is, how difficult it is, and how, um, in fact, we can do something about it. We need not be hopeless. So um, here's the process for today. Uh, the show takes about 30 minutes. And I'll say a couple things before we get started. And we'll, we'll do the show. And then uh, after the show, we'll have a panel discussion. There's two parts to the panel discussion. The first thing I'd want to do is just process the show quite briefly with you. Um, talking about it personally, how did it affect you, um, what is this, how was it delivered, that sort of thing. And then we will move into um, talking about how you as professionals can engage with this issue and the advocates who are here. So without further ado, we'll get started. Hi, um, my name is Kathy Plord. I'm the director of Adverb. We're housed in WCHP, but the work goes across all of the campus uh, projects and programs. You are a testament to that. Thank you very much. Um, the play was created a long time ago and keeps being uh, tweaked and, and, and changed to reflect current culture and current times. For example, there was no Facebook when it first started, so we had to make some adjustments there. Um, I wanted to give you just a couple of somber notes to get started on. Just on that way. Uh, over the weekend, there was a man from South Liberty who was arrested for assaulting a woman in her home. Uh, he was hiding in a dumpster, and a neighbor had called the police. A neighbor stepped in. The Maine governor's office indicates that seven of the, uh, six of the 17 homicides that have taken place in Maine this year so far hom uh, domestic violence related. That's not a small number. Usually, we hover about half. Um, and we're heading into a season where stresses uh, start to run high. Um, it's serious, you know this, and I would love for you to just spend some time stepping back, going into um, what can we do, and joining five male characters who are exploring their role in this issue with the people they love and the people they know. It's performed for you today by Brian Chamberlain. Um, and again, it takes about 30 minutes. And um, welcome to those who are live streaming in Biddeford and um, in other places far off in the world. How's everyone doing? Come on. Jeez. Uh, I'd just like to start. Uh, heartfelt thank you to all you guys for being here. And uh, we have folks joining in from around the United States and the UK. So thank you guys very much. Um, hope you all enjoy it. Stand the man here to steer you clear, to answer your questions and provide you with suggestions. You got a little lovely, you getting cuddly, you feeling studly, you come to me, my advice is free. Dear Abby's got the get up, stand the man tells you to you straight up, no setup. Dear stand the man, I've got a new girlfriend. Well, hey, congratulations. Oh, complications. She's wanting to wait, and I'm wondering how long it'll take, signed, <laughs> Andy Ticipation. Well, that's a dandy situation, Mr. Andy Ticipation, and I got a good vibration. You're going to get real good at waiting, so savor the flavor of anticipating. Players, pay attention to this small demonstration for Misty, Mr. Andy Ticipation. Now, the word is no. No, you're not ready. No, because you ain't prepared, or Andy's son, the uh, truth might hurt. No, not if he was the last man on earth. Now, in each of these scenarios, she's saying it in stereo with one common denominator, so just slow down your carburetor, dog. She said no. No, that's the time of day, and I got lots more to say. Now we get the ABCs and the one, two, threes out of the way. Send me a letter. We'll see if we can make it all better. Stand the man here to steer you clear. I tell you, 
The way people talk about sex all the time, you think half the world was getting it daily, right? It's in the movies, like, it's like they kiss and then bada boom, next instant they're doing it. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's not like you can pick up a basketball and be in the NBA. And people keep your score, right? Everybody's waiting for you to kiss and tell. Now me, uh, I was kind of a, uh, a late bloomer, right? Back in the day, I got this uh, nickname, Verge. Short for Virgin Larry. <laughs> yeah, right? Very funny. Day in, day out. Hey, Virge, good, mo good moves with the ball today. Too bad you can't score in bed like you score on the court. Yo, yo, and if Gator Radar is turned on you, whew, well, buckle up, buddy. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Hey, Virge, if I ever hear you shooting for the other team, you kiss your sorry ass goodbye. Nice. No, 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 no. I got the first chicken bed that I could. It went well. I mean, actually, I mean, things were... A little premature. But yo, 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 I mean that in several ways. And they call that irony, right? It's pretty funny. No, it isn't. Well, you think it's been e easy having the nickname Virgin Larry? Why do some people think that being in a lousy relationship is better than being in no relationship? I mean, why is someone who's supposed to love and care about somebody else regularly and publicly treat them like crap? I mean, why are relationships so complicated? Why am I ranting? Oh, okay. Here's the situation. There's like eight or 10 of us hanging out. Jana and John are there. Now, I'm probably more friends with Jana than with John, but I mean, we're just friends. Actually, things have gotten kind of weird between us since they started seeing each other. I mean, John seems to think that Jana's his property. It's so unlike Jana. Anyway, she's barely said two words this whole time. And then she just like, offers an opinion about something. Well, John jumps all over her, calling her all kinds of names. The nicest thing he said was, you're an idiot, you don't know nothing. And then he said, why the hell are you wearing those tight jeans that make you look fat? And I'm looking around, I'm seeing if anyone's gonna say something. It's not happening, Jenna looked like she wanted to die, so I had to say something. John, you're talking trash, Jenna, don't put up with his lip. Well, then John starts jumping all over me. Hey, Mr. Mitchell, what do you think you're doing? Scan on my woman in front of my face? Mm. Um, no, dude, just don't think you need to be screaming at people, especially your girlfriend. Then a couple of others joined in, calling him crazy, paranoid. <laughs> yeah, he took that well. Wound up storming off, taking Jana with him, but not before laying down offers to rearrange my face. I mean, I don't want to mess in business that isn't mine, but I'm worried about her. And this isn't the first time. And if this is how he treats her in public, what else is going on in private? Part of me keeps saying, it's not your problem, Mitch, man, mind your own business. But I don't know, I just feel like if I don't do something about it, I'm just part of the problem. <clears throat> I need something to drink. I'll be back. Do you realize everything considered feminine or unmanly, that's everything it takes to be a good father? Oh, that word, father. Jana called me Dada, then Daddy, then Dad. And then when her mother and I divorced, Michael. Now, I don't think she's ever forgiven me for the divorce. You know, it sounds cliche, but your kids do grow up overnight. And I remember, I used to say, you know, when Jana got to be of the dating age, that I'd, uh, well, she wouldn't be dating. And now I'm lucky if I even get to meet any of her friends. There's a very independent young woman who lives at the other end of this phone. Jana, hi, it's Michael, how are you? Good, good. No, no, I just haven't seen much of you lately. You seem to spend most of your free time with John. Yes, yeah, I, I, I know he's your boyfriend. Um, how are things going with him? See, like most parents in denial about their kids, oh, no, my little girl isn't old enough to be having sex yet. Maybe when she's 40 or 45. Why? Why? Um, because, uh, because I just wanted to know if you, uh, too, both wanted to 
go to the petting zoo or get some ice cream sometime. Did I really just say that? I, oh, I just said that. We are back with a stack. It's time to find what's on your mind. Dear Stan the Man, if I buy a girl dinner, I want to go home a winner. Any advice? Yo, listen up. I'm not saying it twice, Mr. Unhappy Meal. Here's how I feel. Dinner is a date, not a deal, but it's not too late. So just get real. Dear Stan the Man, a friend of mine is in a violent relationship. He's afraid to get help and he's afraid to leave. How do you help a friend who is gay and not out get out of danger? Heterosexual, bisexual, transgender, gay, lesbian, questioning, whatever orientation, it's a situation wanting liberation, adjusting. Now safety first, get him through the worst, one step at a time. My advice? Call the local hotline. He needs a personalized plan, not just stay in the man. Good luck, all right? Stay in the man. I thought it was true love forever, but we broke up. And now I'm being tagged in some embarrassing photos on Facebook. And people have written some ugly things. And still worse, my ex's friends are making it personal, filling up my mailbox with hate mail. Ooh. Yeah, today this bow, this photo, yeah, that's fine, but tomorrow, maybe you gotta redefine the line because someone dropped a psycho on a dime? I mean, how can a smile so sweet flip the script, beat the creep who can't compete? Virtual friends, virtually impossible to undo, like a tattoo you wish you could redo, or maybe even take back the I love you. Good news, Facebook's got to report abuse policy and procedure. I know, sorry for the hassle, but we all got to recall. Facebook's not a private your space, it's a public chase. Catch yourself a predator, get a stalker's disrespect. It's technology feeding ugly pathology, electronic punches with no apology. Hey, I'm sorry. Remove the tags, maybe take down your site, or maybe rethink photographing how you spend your night. Threats and defamation, take them to the station. <clears throat> now, y'all know that approximately 73% of all rapes are committed by friends, family members, and acquaintances. Now, apparently, it's not the stranger in a dark alley a woman has to fear as much as she has to, well, Fear the smiling faces around her. That's a conversation stopper, isn't it? Well, my name is Officer Friendly, and before y'all say something smart, that is my real name. Now, everywhere I go, there's always someone in the audience with a story. That's the same story every audience. He or she will say, excuse me, sir, but I know a guy whose life was ruined when he was falsely accused of rape by a woman wanting to get revenge. All right, well, first, let's debunk the myth that millions of wrongfully accused rapists walk the streets. And we'll just start with the fact that there is no statistical difference between falsely reported rapes and falsely reported crimes in general. Only 2% of rapes are found to be falsely reported. More often than not, rapes go unreported. More often than not, rapes go unreported. Now, why would a rape go unreported? It's a good question. Unfortunately, there's all kinds of reasons. Remember I just told you that approximately 73% of all rapes are committed by someone that victim knows? And there's always going to be those who think she must have asked for it. Now we all know that no one is ever asking to be raped. And we're blaming the victim in a very helpful strategy. And well, shoot, as far as falsely claiming rape to get some sort of revenge, there's much more expedient ways of seeking revenge in a court of law which I'm going to decline to go into in the interest of promoting nonviolence. Fall sports in this school include sex, drugs, alcohol, and seeing how many first years you can score before the playoffs. So far, the season's off to a good start. The Virgin Larry's become remarkably smooth, right? I set up the approach. I dodge the defense. I anticipate the side escape. Touchdown, three points, home run, score! 
Come on, don't look at me that way, because that's how you tell the story when anybody wants to know. And they always do. Hey, uh, a buddy of mine, he's, he's probably my best friend, uh, Tom. Tom the Terminator, we call him. He's team captain. He's unstoppable on the court. Well, one time he got in some trouble, right? This girl said that he raped her. So I asked him. I said, Tom, tell it to me straight. He was hurt. He couldn't believe I was going to take what this girl said over him. You know, I believe him. If he, he says he didn't do it, he didn't do it. He's my boy. The girl was sorry she ever brought it up. But... <sighs> and, um, a couple weeks ago, Tom said that he had a video. For some of the basketball team to watch after practice. You know, he's trying to get into YouTube's Five Million Club, so he's always bringing new stuff, but this time he's got a, a home movie he calls it. Well, a few minutes into watching it, it's clear, it's clear. This girl, she ain't got no idea that she's on candid camera, much less she was going to be on display for some of the basketball team's play-by-play -play review. She also, uh, she also wasn't all that willing either. I mean, she said stop, like, a few times, but. Tom, unstoppable Tom the Terminator had selective hearing that night. You know, and this was bad. There was like a room full of animals screaming for more, wishing they could have had a term, you know. Go, Tom, go, Tom, you're the man, you're the man. Yeah, Tom, you're the man. <clears throat> anyway, a couple days later, that girl found out that she missed the private screening. But see, I'd already forgotten about that girl from before. So back then, I just wondered if I was believing who I wanted to believe, you know. I like to eat things when I'm nervous, so I'm just going to go this way. Um, Janice studies at the library while John's at work, so I decided to talk to her there when John won't be around. Janice is at a study table. Jana, hey, I'm, uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing, so I just whoosh, jump in. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just kind of worried. She cuts me off. Um, excuse me, but I'm studying here and I have a lot of work to do. The table over there is free. Okay. Like a minute or so goes by and then she gets up and she goes to the water fountain and on the way back she drops a note next to me. Meet me at the 700 stack in three minutes, but don't leave when I do and go a different way. What is it, a James Bond movie? <sighs> Jenna. Jenna. Je oh, hey, what's with the spy meets spy stuff? She says John's friends report to him who she talks to because he's jealous of other guys. No, he's, he's protective that way. What way isn't he protective? This is abusive. She says, John's not abusive. He loves me. He never hit me. This type of behavior is abusive. Having his friends track who you talk to is abusive. Just not being able to talk to who you want to. Jenna, even if he hasn't hit you, this, this controlling crap, putting you down in front of other people, it's worse than hitting you because no one can see those marks. Oh, and hey, what about the hole in the wall? Yeah, the one he punched next to your head at the party the other night? She was startled. But she defended him. She says he doesn't mean it. He's getting better. He always feels terrible afterwards. She said that I don't know, know him like she does. That I don't see how tender, loving, and generous he can be. Yeah, she's got a point. Jenna, I'm sure he's got his good points. I mean, everybody does. She asked me, what do I want? Because she has to go now. What do I want? I just... I want you to know that I'm here if you need to talk. You know, I just want to know that you're okay, safe. She says she's fine. She says she's leaving now. And if I'm that concerned for her, I won't make it worse. And she left. Great. So she knows it can get worse. Great. Dear Stan the Man, 
What if a guy and a girl are both drinking and they have sex? Later, she says she hadn't wanted to, but was too messed up to be able to say stop. I say that she was drinking and shouldn't have been drunk if she didn't want to fool around, but my friend Joe says that's rape. Thanks for steering us clear. No problem, dog. That's why I'm here. So your friend Joe thinks if a girl gets dressed up and then is too messed up, that's rape? Yo, it's no great debate. Your friend Joe knows which way the wind blows, what the rules are. This, this we were both drinking, thinking, ooh, that is a trap not getting you far. I mean, you drunk driving. It's a matter of fact. It's who's driving the car, sits behind the bars. Not your friend passed out inside you took for a ride. It's a tragedy if you ain't capable of sympathy, don't know empathy, can't just imagine being in someone else's skin. It's time you stepped in. It's time to visualize, now to open your eyes. Imagine this. Imagine your sister or your mother, or one good friend or another. Maybe you on the telephone, maybe you're both alone. Okay, now. Now she says she's got something important to say. She's seeing shades of gray. She needs you to listen and not go away. You hear her fear, and she's got your ear. Now she's got a friend, real, charming, and smart, who's been after her heart. Then she tells you something bad happened. She thinks that maybe she had a little too much to drink, or maybe she had nothing to drink but a Pepsi. Then she tells you they were getting a little friendly. Cut to where she's saying no. She pushes his hand away. He tries again anyway. She says no, number two. Now what's he going to do? And this time, as he's crossing the line, she stays real quiet and still. So he thinks he's got a green light to cruise down this hill. He's not slow and he keeps going. She already said, no, no, no. But all that's in his head is go, go, go. Doctor's analysis, she's got paralysis. She can only watch it. She can't stop. I mean, this is making war, dog, not love. I can't tell you more. G is for green, G is for go, but the G is silent, and that's enough. I mean, this is your sister or your friend, and yeah, I'll end. Removing illusions, avoiding confusions, empathy like sympathy, only better. Stay in the man. Thanks for the letter. No, it doesn't make me happy that Jana hasn't confided in you either. Look, look, I understand, I understand that you're upset, but can we please put our own issues aside and focus on Jana? I will call you as soon as I talk to her. Yes, yes, I'm calling her now. Bye. I know, me too. I mean, weeks go by without her mother and I hardly seeing her. How could we know? I didn't see it myself. I have to have one of Jana's friends tell me what's going on. <laughs> my job is to take care of my daughter, to protect her. How long has he been humiliating her, intimidating her, hurting her? What I don't understand is how it got to this point. How did Jana get herself in this position to begin with? I didn't realize that I've let her down. I didn't realize it could hurt this much. Jana hides me. It's your father. Is this a good time? We need to talk. Now you think if someone's been raped, they'd know it, right? Sadly, it's not so simple as it sounds. Oftentimes, rapes are unrecognized by the victim as rape because of alcohol or drug use or because they've been raped by someone that they've previously been intimate with. Now, frankly, there's no, there's no mention in the U.S. Constitution of the right to have sex with someone who's unwilling, even if they are married or dating. <laughs> you know, people usually want to know why I do this, right? I mean, what kind of idiot in their right mind would stand up in front of crowds of folks and dish out facts and statistics about sexual assault? Or the, uh, what, the, uh, the People magazine or the uh, a reality TV mentality would have me tell you that my sister was raped, raped and killed. So because of that, I made it my mission to go out and spread the word. Or, 
It could be that there's some young transgendered person here in this school who's been harassed by some hateful, narrow-minded gang, and I'm coming to the League of Rescue. Or it could be that the local police department was tipped off about someone who's been trying to drop date rape drugs at parties. Now, some of that, all of that, or none of that could be why I do this. But not one of us, now myself included, have to wait for the excuse of something terrible happening before we just act like we care. Oh, basketball, yeah, well, it's a great analogy for life, but seeing a game, there's this boundaries, there's rules, there's referees. You know in life half the time, I think guys are just waiting for the ref to blow a whistle on a foul, and then there's no whistle. This time I wasn't even on the court, I just watched it from the sidelines. And there was no whistle. Just a call from the athletic director. The girl from Tom's Home Movie went to the police, the school's review on the whole situation, possible expulsions for anybody that was there, or, or they just might revoke our athletic scholarships. Yeah, Tom the Terminator lived, lived up to his name, all right. But see, me, I did nothing. I did nothing. I did nothing to stop it. So... I wanted to say that I'm your father, and I would do anything to have you be happy. I know I can't live your life for you, that you need to make your own choices, but even if you are all grown up, you're not alone. If you ever need to talk to me, I will listen. I will always love you. I will always trust you. I will not judge you. Just let me in. That's what I wanted to say. But like most parents, what I actually said was, Damn it, Jenna, why didn't you tell me? I, uh, I called the local hotline. I told, uh, you can... Find the number in the front of the phone book, or you can Google it. I, I told him my name was Horatio Sebastian Guadalupe, something stupid. Anyway, they immediately told me that it was an anonymous, confidential call that I didn't need to worry. So, so I told them Jana's situation, and they walked me through her risk analysis. Now, the list of what happens if she stays is essentially the same list of what happens if she leaves. She may have loss of friends, loss of intimacy, she could have trouble at home or work, and she might get hurt. The bad news is that Jana is in most physical danger when she decides to leave. But, but if she calls the hotline, they can help her set up a safety plan for herself. I mean, I called the hotline just because I wanted some answers, and it was good to hear that I've been doing things right, but there's no quick fix. You're probably wondering how, how I get to be so smart and why I play this part, how I got this attitude. All right, I'll give you a clue. I watched my father beat my mother, and then he would drag her into the bedroom. My father couldn't leave him. My mother couldn't leave my father. She couldn't press charges, and the cops stopped coming. My father is yelling, my mother is screaming, then silence. I'm relieved. But there's no telling if my ma was crying that time I was conceived. Now, if this were your sister, your mother, your friend, your brother, I mean, you'd all want justice to the full extent of the law. Now, if it is ever you, please get the help you need. 
And do it for yourself. And if you can't do it for that, do it so there won't be that next victim. I did nothing to stop it. I didn't think about leaving, and I didn't tell anybody. So that means I'm not an innocent bystander. You know, if maybe if I would have got, got up and left, then maybe others would have too, and it would have just been Tom standing there wondering what he should have done differently. I need help keeping my daughter safe. Who will help me? Please. All I can do is stand up when something isn't right. And I can listen to Jana, not judge. Just, just be there and give her time. In this time, in my words and my rhyme, I've shed some light on what's wrong and what's right. It's time for the violence to end, and it starts with you and your friends, but stand the man can't hold your hand. You the man. Ladies, too. Now what you gonna do? Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I'm going to start on the end there. Uh, good day. My name is Matthew Perry. I work for Family Crisis Services, which is the local domestic uh, violence resource center in Cumberland County. Uh, there are sister agencies all through the state uh, for every county. Actually, uh, every place in the United States has a domestic violence resource center assigned to it. So there is resources and services for everyone in the country. Um, I also work in the Young Adult Abuse Prevention Program, so I spend most of my time in schools, colleges, and community uh, also providing awareness around the issue of dating and domestic violence. And uh, just a reaction? Um, I've seen this many times over 10 years, uh, and it still uh, reminds me why I'm excited to get up every day and do the work that I do. Uh, I don't love my job, but I believe my job is necessary. And uh, when you hear the truths and the stories in your neighborhoods and on your campus, I think that would engage you uh, to want to do something about it also. Hi everyone, my name is Angela Giordano and I'm with Sexual Assault Response Services of Southern Maine. Um, so we are the local sexual assault resource center for Cumberland County as well as York County um, in the state of Maine. And, and like Matthew said, there are other centers that serve other parts of the state and all across the country. So um, I am with the education program there. Um, I'm the ed program manager and we have a team that does educational programs throughout Southern Maine uh, pertaining to these, these, the issue of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, I've seen the, the play a couple times, a handful of times now. It is hugely impactful. Every time I see it, it's, it's just so rich um, and throws a lot at you guys and, and the audiences um, with all the different characters. I think the thing that strikes me the most um, is, is the role of the bystander and how this issue is just huge. It doesn't just impact that victim, it really impacts a whole network of people who are connected to that one person. Um, and thinking about ways that we can, we can play a role in that, a really positive role in someone's healing um, or in the prevention of it as well. My name is Margie Harmer-Bean. I'm a faculty member here at the University of New England. And I've had experience with family uh, violence in uh, creating an education program for healthcare professionals, uh, dental professionals in particular. And I um, actually am going to be doing a training coming up in a few weeks at Maine Med. 
and I think that this program is outstanding. I think the subject matter is emotional. It can be frightening. And I think we need to draw upon our courage to confront it. And I always am moved by this production. And um, I have also had experience um, as a professor with a student that has come to me, in fact, many students over the years. And having resources here on campus has been uh, an outstanding and caring uh, thing that the university does. So uh, hopefully I can feed back a little bit uh, about that um, as we go through our panel. Great, thanks. Thank Mandy. you. I'm Brian, and you guys know what I do, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh, gosh, <laughs> why did you do that to me? <laughs> Thanks. Great. We're very appreciative of the Interprofessional Education Collaborative for bringing this uh, in October. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and um, our job right now is to stitch together um, how this fits into our personal lives because that does connect to our professional lives. So just a few responses, questions about the content, um, and a few um flag people down, we can get people in queue and move quickly. So Amy's got the mic. So any, any thoughts, things you'd like to share in the moment? You will not be seen on camera, just so you know. I think it'll get stitched in. I generally have a pretty good wait time, but um, I don't want to put you on the spot in this spot. So um, there are a couple layers that we've got going on here and a couple activities that we're going to do along the way. But let's first dig into some of what you can offer interprofessionally. I know that you have fielded phone calls from people. Can we just talk about the concept of using the hotline and how that works for you all and maybe any experiences that you've had, particularly with medical folks on this issue? Um, yeah, so we have a 24-hour crisis and support line that's available to you all in probably a couple different ways. Um, so you as a service provider might be calling because you have a client or a patient who needs a referral or has some questions and you're just looking for resources for them. So we can, if sexual assault is, is, is an issue that's come up um, when you're working with them or maybe you see some red flags um, and you want to talk to somebody. So that's available to you um, through us and we can provide you with some of those, some of those resources, talk about how we can help with one-on-one -on -one advo advocacy if that person needs it, with emotional support. Um, our crisis and support line is 24 hours um, and it's confidential, anonymous, um, just like we saw in the play. Um, and the other aspect might be if you know, something triggers you. So um, we know that this issue is far reaching, so it affects a lot of people, like I said uh, before. And so um, if you have some things that are coming up for you, maybe you know somebody or you've had an experience with this issue, we're here for you as well. Um, so we're here to support and provide you with resources and options um, as you're facing that as, as somebody in the health profession. I would also like to add, in addition, uh, our hotline also provides those services. Um, I'm not sure if folks have ever called the hotline, and so I think uh, sometimes people don't know what's going to happen at the end. So I like to tell folks that um, I've been doing this for 15 years. I am a trained uh, domestic violence advocate, and I think I'm pretty good at it. And it's not because I talk a lot. I think I'm a good listener. And I think that's one of the keys about being on the hotline, is providing you, if you're calling, whether it's happening to you or you're supporting someone, listening to what you, your needs are, what the situation is. And when you are done speaking and hope that I say something in return, um, I'm not the answer man. I'm the option dude. That I'm not here to tell you what to do or to tell the person you're working with what to do. I'm gonna give you as many options as I can think of 
and then I'm gonna support you supporting your client or supporting you on your option. I might have thought option A would be what I would choose, but you chose D, so we're gonna support you with D. And that's the piece that I think is important. You're driving that call, you are calling because you need help, and I wanna to try to provide that how it is helpful for you, not for me to hang up and say, man, I did a great job. I need you to feel like you have, you were listened to, that you have more information, and now that you have options and steps to go from there, and then maybe you'll call back that line tomorrow night because now you have more questions, or now you need some support or need somebody to listen how those options work for you. So hotlines aren't magic. They can't solve things just because you called. It's that work in providing that space. I'd like to um, say that as a healthcare professional, I a have, oh, sorry, um, I'd like to say as a healthcare professional, I keep those hotline numbers right near my operatory where I treat my patients, and I have them available for um, any interaction. And there's a, um, a great list of hotlines through the DHS uh, at the state level. So with just a click away, um, you can get that list of numbers. And so being prepared for it, uh, for any type of interaction around um, domestic violence or family violence is important as a healthcare professional. Great. Um, could we get folks who created posters to give us a brief, uh, and I asked a couple of you earlier, what was the big takeaway uh, in your research in creating these posters and connecting uh, domestic violence or sexual assault to your profession? Uh, just a couple of those would be nice to hear. I'm gonna get some crosstalk going. And if there's another hand, um, so we can keep you an eye on who's next. Hi, so we did our poster on disabil disability and domestic violence, and I think the biggest thing that we took away from it was that there's a lot more people than we actually thought that are um, victims, and one thing that we found that was really interesting to us was that a reason why a lot of the women stay with their abusers is because the men will withhold things they need for their disability, so like wheelchairs or medication or things like that just so that will, it will decrease our functional capability. So I think that was one of the biggest things that we took away from it, so. Thank you, that's intense. Someone else who had a poster? You're sharing with each other, and this is one of those, oh, there we go. Um, I'm close, Amy, I'll get this one here. And if someone um, would flag for next so that we move along quickly. Um, we did this poster right over here on occupational therapy. Um, we, did, we are three occupational therapy students, so we uh, focused in on what we could do. Um, so after it's been recognized that these people are survivors of domestic violence, um, what we can do to help improve their lives once they've gotten away from their abuser. Um, this could be anything from developing a realistic budget and helping them take care of their children that they may have um, to support for further education if they would like to go back to school. So just little things like that, little steps that we can help them take so it doesn't seem so overwhelming. Um, I didn't do a poster, but um, just from my observation of all of them, especially this poster over here that Brittany was just talking about, um, it's amazing how domestic violence affects every aspect of somebody's life. So the poster points out um, our activities of daily living, like our self-care, um, how it affects our sleep and rest, our work, our education, our leisure, and how we participate socially. So I think that's something to note, definitely. The implications are profound. Uh, another poster, there's a couple more posters here. We can speak to another two. Thank you. <laughs> um, we did our poster on mandated reporting, and I think the biggest thing I took away is that the system in place currently isn't as effective as I think it could be. Um, in my opinion, healthcare providers should all be, should all have training on how to approach these situations, and I think that although it may be the law for us to report, if you don't have the empathy that goes behind your, the person, then you're just reporting it. It's just a number to write down on your chart. And 
I think to make it really client-centered and not so, this is how we're doing it with every patient. It needs to be specific and. Um, and this would be open to anybody else to answer as well. What do you think gets in the way of people actually doing their job of finding out and, and digging in and you know, identifying it with a patient or a client? Why don't we do it? I think it's a scary issue, and it's something that a lot of us don't want to talk about because it's one of those things that it's, it's private. And I think as maybe a victim of domestic violence, they don't want to report it because the implications of reporting it may be worse than what they're dealing with right now. So you're reporting it, and then you go home, and the police come in, and nothing's really done and then the abuser gets even more abusive, and it's a downward cycle of awfulness. <laughs> um, I was speaking to a couple of folks in the back about substance abuse. Um, uh, yeah, would you talk a little about what you know about substance abuse and domestic violence? That was a, a good conversation. Um, we did our poster on the general aspect of dealing with patients who are who are domestic, who are domestically abused. Um, one thing that we touched on was substance abuse and how the aspect of whether it's the abuser who is abusing substance and how the violence can come out when they use their substance. Not necessarily that the idea is only there when they're abusing um, their victim, but the fact that the actual substance abuse is what brings out the action. And then we also talked about how the abusee could be um, looking for substance abuse to deal with the coping issue of being abused. So um, I'll turn to our panel for a moment. Can you respond to some of what you're hearing? Uh, thoughts? Any remarks? Um, it's, as far as being mandated reporters, I think Maine is pretty forward thinking in that they are listing um, report uh, professions specifically. And one of the things that comes across to me is that it's not our job as healthcare professionals, most of us, uh, to solve the domestic problems, but it is our duty, both ethically and legally, to recognize any suspected abuses and report them. And I think sometimes health professionals say, have a lot of emotion, um, they're, they're scared, they're afraid that it might impact their patient, um, com not compliance, but um, the, the bottom line, if you will, um, that they might stir something up in the community, that type of thing, but realistically, it's important to realize your duty legally and ethically and make that report. And even though we might think that the system is broken, we have to have faith that it's going to work in in some way or another to intervene um, in this um, problem that we have in, in society. Um, I can say that um, I know that we offer, we talked a little bit about having some further training on these issues because they're, they're kind of big and not something that we talk about often and maybe a little bit scary to, to approach. Um, we do offer a, a volunteer training. It's a 40-hour training um, for free uh, for people to learn some advocacy skills. Um, and that might assist you in your, your profession. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can get in touch with our, our agency and we can let you know when the next one's gonna happen. Um, people who take that training also serve on our crisis and support line as volunteers. Um, so if that's of interest to you too, I definitely would love to see, see you doing that as well. Um, there was something else I was gonna, maybe I'll come back to it, Matthew. Uh, my volunteer coordinator would also like me to say that we have a volunteer training also. Um, and so, again, some people take that to be on the hotline, and some utilize it in their profession also. A couple of things that I wanted to um, just quickly talk about is one of the reasons I like this production is because it has a lot of truths in it. And for most of us, if we grew up in this country, we actually learned a lot of lies and myths about domestic violence and sexual assault as we grew up. They were sold to us as truths. So what I realize is that we all have a bunch of crap in our heads, not because we asked for it, 
but because we've been observant and listened. It's in jokes, it's in movies, it's in media, it's in uh, the news that has misinformation. So sometimes people think abuse is about alcohol, or abuse is because of anger problems, or abuse only happens to those with low self-esteem, and all of those are myths. Alcohol is a problem. 80% of domestic violence situations that police come, alcohol 80% of the time is there. That doesn't mean that alcohol caused a problem. Like my friend said, the alcohol was, um, made it more intense, maybe lowered the inhibition of that person who normally caps his actions knowing they're gonna get in trouble, and they didn't. I know anger management is often put out as an issue why people choose to be abusive, Anger management isn't the problem. What I've learned with abusers, they're excellent at dealing with their anger. They know exactly when to use their anger, and they don't use it when somebody's around that they can get in trouble. They don't yell at the police officer when they come. They don't threaten to kill somebody else except for their partner when they're alone. So anger might be an emotion that they feel, but it is not the root cause of abuse. It's believing that you have the right to use this power and control over your partner to get what you want, because you feel you have the right to either be listened to, have your dinner on time, or to, when you say to have the kids quiet, the kids need to be quiet. Those are the reasons that domestic violence happens, and I'm not an expert on sexual assault, but I know sexual assault is also about <laughs> power and control, and isn't just because it happened. And so I think these are some of the nuggets that are really important before you tease out to some of the bystander, which is also important, is really to have that foundation and understanding and not to be judgmental. And also in your case, also to ask, but listen just as much as you provide information. Um, Angela, before we go to uh, the role play part with Sarah, who's also an advocate here, um, would you, do you have anything fresh in your mind about the crossover between sexual assault and domestic violence and prevalence? Well, I think we heard in the play that it's most often somebody known to the victim. Um, so it could be a family member who's the abuser or um, a dating partner. So I think, I don't know that I have any statistics of how frequently it, that is the case, but it's more than two thirds of the time that the, the attacker or the perpetrator is known to the victim. Can you expound on uh, reproductive or sexual coercion sort of as a control method and what the there's a range of things. Yeah, yep. um, I'm not sure. I, I, I guess I'm. Could you clarify? Um, like how do you want me to speak well, to reproductive I'm coercion? About, it could be a tactic that's being used. Yes. Yes. Okay. Could you share some tactics? Yeah. So reproductive coercion is, um, you know, maybe sabotaging uh, uh, contraceptive use, like poking holes in a condom, or and, and using using that to to have power and control over someone's partner, right? Their partner. They're they're maybe not telling them that they're doing this in order to have control over their body, right? That's a really serious thing. We're talking about, um, you know, pregnancy and, and, and that kind of, you know, somebody's body and ownership over their body. Um, so sabotaging sex. those kinds of things and, yeah. and, and being, um, I think you can see coercion is also, you know, talking somebody into something, being manipulative, um, using your power to get somebody to do something they didn't want to do. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it's something that we're definitely seeing. It might yeah. f float over into the domestic, yeah. the dating and relationship abuse piece. So what but I was leading with that was, so yeah. if your client or patient has domestic violence in their history, there's a good chance that they have sexual assault in their history. Just something to note, not always true for both directions. Um, what happens in a body, um, and you may have some answers as well, I think a couple of posters referred to some of this stuff, so please, please flag us down. What happens in a body physically, Let's, we can talk about mental stuff later, Let's start with the physical, the somatic issues that come out of this kind of trauma. Any thoughts on that? I know there's some listed on those posters. Make up answers. Yell them out and I'll repeat them. Oh, excellent. She'll use the mic even. Thanks. When it comes to physical, I don't know the exact statistic, but I know um, sometimes it's really hard to leave that partnership because when you leave, that's when the abuser gets really dangerous and like that's when you have even more of a chance to be killed because the abuser seems, sees that they have nothing left to lose. So that's 
one thing. Yep. <laughs> that does get pretty much the ultimate physical. You could die. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking other things. Do you have stuff? 75% of the homicides within Maine um, uh, occur if they're domestic violence homicides when the person is actually leaving the relationship. So that is, as uh, you know, in your mind, you're like, well, if they just leave, everything will be great. But what you saw is that ultimately it could be great, but that process too, because that person is losing the control that they had. Mm -hmm. And so that is the time that they feel that they need to ratch up their uh, actions to make sure they can regain their control. And often it is by using fear and instilling uh, threats uh, and physical harm. So that is why uh, that often might uh, ratchet it up yeah. at that point. Let me throw out a couple things, IBS. Migraines, um, arthritis can be exacerbated. Um, you can have stomach um, issues unresolved. Um, a lot of times if there's a, a physical issue that you can't really pin a source on, that's connected in there. Am I missing any, Margie, that you would want to add? I think anxiety and depression is also uh, physical. And I have observed uh, with the interaction that I've had with a few students over the years is, is that uh, during times of um, trying to leave, the anxiety is ratcheted up and safety issues are huge at that time, as, as um, we all know. And um, again, we have resources at the university, counseling services, um, as well as our, our uh, community services to mm -hmm. help individuals uh, on campus. Did anybody that. look at any um, strangulation stuff in their work? And so do you have any sense of what strangulation long term can do for physical complaints? Um, do you, have you done any of that work, Margie? No, other than recognizing the, the other than recognizing the signs, mm -hmm. physical signs as a healthcare provider. Uh, and, and then acting upon those uh, right. signs. Um, I guess it's really prevalent. Uh, the Domestic Violence Coalition here in Maine has done a recent survey that will just scare the pants off you. It's just amazing how uh, frequent it is. And they did this study where they talked to both the perpetrators and the abusers and the correlation between um, who's telling what story is almost exact. So we know this is quite valid in the information. The long-term damage in the neck and the throat um, is amazing. I can't, I'm not a medical person, but you could, yeah. yeah. Our medical person, Sarah. So Sarah's gonna tell you a little about that and then we'll do a role play. I am not a medical person, no. Um, I, uh, so I'm Sarah, I work with Matthew um, at um, Family Crisis Services, but um, she brought up strangulation. I just wanna read off that study for you. So 150 women um, in shelters were asked um, if they were strangled during um, the time that they were with their partner and 72% said they were strangled. Of those 72%, 24 percent received medical attention. So um, not even close to the amount that we're hoping to, to get in to, to see medical attention, um, which is really, really scary. Um, and 84 percent of the, the 72 said it was part of their ongoing assault. Um, so this happened ongoing. And if I may, like, I think it's really important that uh, w what Kathy said, like five years ago, we were not thinking about this. And so it takes people to recognize and bring it forth and help us, because before it used to be choking. And we would use this as an example of how you change the term choking, though we've all choked at some point. But choking is not strangulation. Ch choking is when something's stuck in your windpipe. Strangulation is when somebody's crushing your windpipe from the outside. They have found that juries and judges will not prosecute as much if you use the term choking because it does not sound as serious or violent. So that all police officers have been trained to utilize the term strangulation in their reports because it accurately reflects the crime that had been committed, which often would be not seen as important if you use the different words. So a lot of the terminology is so important to really understand and highlight the truths opposed to the myths that we've been taught in the past. Yeah, uh, we've got a comment. I just wanted to say that um, we hadn't said it yet explicitly, but You the Man is, sets out a series of premises, and I just want to make sure to say that violence and assault are not gendered. 
make sure that everybody yeah. realizes that. Yeah, and that was um, something that came out. I'm glad the grooming poster got put up here, but that was one from last year, which was really important that um, so no one had picked it up as a topic this year and we wanted to bring it back. Pretty much the abuse rates are even until about age eight. Is it one in six, boys? You do the math. One in six, boys. Abuse rates are even until age eight. So um, it's, in the, it's in our world. We know people, whether or not they're talking about it, whether or not they've repressed it, um, or whether or not they're, you know, found a place to be okay with it. Um, not that you're okay with that, but to be okay with themselves in this situation. So um, let's jump into a couple role plays here. We wanted to model some hotline calls for you. I think this is gonna be valuable. And if we could, you have something to say first? I have something to say about what it's like to actually call the crisis and support line just because it, this is gonna look a little different. Sure. So if someone calls in, if you call in, you're gonna get our answering service and they're gonna say answering service for sexual assault response services. Um, and you just say, I'd like to speak to an advocate. They're gonna take a first name only um, and a phone number so that someone can call you back. Um, so what we'll model here is the callback if that helps clarify what that process is like. And they call you back within 20 minutes. Okay, so I forgot so. to give them their water. I'm a bad host. Mm -hmm. So um, is it, would it be helpful for the two of you to just tip your chairs away from each other as you start this? Yes, yeah. is that all right? Yeah. Okay, do we need to know anything before you start? Um, Who are you? Yeah, maybe that would be, I, I will be the sexual assault advocate that calls um, the caller back. Okay. And I'm gonna be a healthcare professional. Um, and let me just say this too, where Brian is a, a paid actor, we are not, so role playing, <laughs> bear with. Um, and we might break and, and rehash things if we need to. Great, yeah. yeah. All yours. Okay. Should I ring, ring, ring? <laughs> Do you wanna answer? You should answer, because I'm calling you back. Oh, good, okay. Um, hello. Hi, is Sarah there? This is Sarah. Hi, Sarah, this is Angela. I'm returning your call from Sexual Assault Response Services. How can I help you today? Uh, hi, Angela, I am actually um, a healthcare professional. I just had one of my patients in and, and had some concerns that I just wanted to talk to you about today. I think that's great, yeah. Um, great, so one of my patients just came in and, and I, mm -hmm. I spoke with her a little bit about um, you know, just my basic screening questions that I ask every patient. Um, and one of the responses just got me a little concerned. Um, one of my routine questions that I ask is, mm -hmm. um, has my partner, has your partner ever forced you to have sex when you didn't want to? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer kind of just made me a little concerned. Um, she said something like, I, I'm his wife, so it's not sexual assault, and he's never really forced me, but yes, there have been times that I haven't wanted to have sex. Uh, okay. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that and, and seeing what kind of things I can offer to her. Yeah. Just so you know, too, I, I spoke with her and, and offered her this hotline. Great. Um, she, she didn't want the hotline number, didn't think it was safe to, to go home with that hotline number. Yep. But she did um, ask me if I could call on behalf of her. So that's why I'm calling. Well, first off, I'm really glad that you called. Um, that's great that you had our number to offer her. I completely understand that she, she couldn't take it with her. Um, and I'm really glad that you were able to call for her. Um, definitely that question, uh, her response to your question about being forced um, to have sex is, is definitely a red flag. Um, I know maybe in a relationship, it sounds like this is her spouse. Um, she feels like, you know, she maybe she's feeling like that it, it's, there's supposed to be sex in that relationship, or maybe she doesn't feel like she has a right to communicate what she what she wants if she doesn't want to. But I would um, I would just let her know that her what she wants deserves to be respected, and she has a right to say no and not not want to to have sex or engage in any kind of sexual activity and have that be respected. Um, yeah. Well, Angela, yeah. let me ask you this. I. Yeah. Um, I can definitely help her um, with her health, but I, I, yeah. I'm not an expert in this. So is there yeah. any way that you could have someone come in and talk to her about all this? Because I don't know if I feel comfortable having that conversation. Yeah, so what, what we can do, I mean, especially if, if a sexual assault has happened recently, 
I don't know if she has any concerns about any injuries or getting checked out. I know that's one thing that we are always concerned about as advocates. We want to make sure that that person gets health health care, um, goes to the emergency department and, and gets a, a kit done um, and gets examined to make sure that they're they're physically okay and um, and and that everything's okay. And we can actually go and be there with her during that process. Okay. Um, so usually the the emergency rooms. Um, if you're, are you calling from Portland? Do you mind if I ask? Um, yeah, we're in the Portland area. Okay. So it, the the emergency rooms at both Main Medical Center and Mercy Hospital know us, and and they'll call us if she decides she wants to go there. Um, if if this is if an assault was recent, you can provide her with that information. Sh I would encourage that if maybe if your office is a safe place, um, if we could talk to her as well, that would be great. Um, if she so you would meet in our office. Um, I think it it would be great for us to talk to her over the phone. Um, maybe with you there, it sounds like she trusts you with this information. Um, and just to make that connection, just to see if she'd want us to meet with her. Um, if she would like that, then I can put in a referral for her to one of our sexual assault response team advocates. Okay. Um, and they can do a follow-up um, phone call or, or whatnot um, with her, and, and especially if she goes to the, the hospital and gets an exam done, um, mm -hmm. she might like that follow-up. And she doesn't have to make a police report or anything like that. And this, I mean, this is sort of just giving you a, an idea of how we help people. It, she she's might doesn't sound like she's really at that place yet where she's she's recognizing it as an assault. Yeah, I, don't I think would she just is. want her to feel supported that her what she, how she feels deserves to be respected in that relationship. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where where I'm coming from. Just so yeah. you have some some idea of how we can help. And there are some other yeah. concerns um, in her relationship. Can I talk to you about those too? Um, well, I think that's a really good question, Sarah. Um, and it sounds like because this is within a you know an intimate partner relationship, I would actually refer you to Family Crisis Services. They um, they help with domestic violence issues. They're the resource center around that, okay. um, and we often work with them to assist. Uh, victim survivors of sexual assault and, and domestic violence if the both things are happening at the same time. So we have a good relationship with them. Um, and I could give you their number if you'd like. Yeah, that would be really helpful. OK, do you have a pen and paper ready? I sure do. Awesome. <laughs> all right, um, so I'm just going to flip through my resource book here because we have all these numbers. And um, OK, so Family Crisis Services, they have a, a hotline that works similar to, to this one. So an advocate will give you a call back. Um, and their number is 1-866-834-4300. Great. Well, okay. thank you. This has been really helpful. Yeah. I'm going to um, go call them right now. Okay, great. And, and, and Sarah, if um, I definitely encourage, you know, give us a call back um, with anything that you need, or if she needs to talk to us, we'd love to talk to her as well. Thanks. thanks thank for, you. And thanks for, you know, doing what you're doing. This is, is, is great. You're really helping her out a lot. So. Nice. Nice. They, they did a good job. <laughs> So while they change um, chairs, maybe, are there any observations about the hotline call? Any surprises? Any things that you want to remember in the future? I see some good chats going on. Um, real quick. Thank you to everybody. Um, but I'm curious, from the standpoint of the students in the audience who are clinicians who may or may not have gone out into the clinic, but ultimately will be mandated reporters, can you speak to the concepts of what some of the red flags are for, in particular, I think as a physical therapist, when we see patients who have repeated injuries or bruises in, you know, wrists or upper arms or, you know, people that are coming in, I'm assuming in the dental industry, chip teeth, you know, significant others who insist on being in the room, like what are those sort of red flags? You just some of that them, they're all good. communication, <laughs> can you speak to those? Can you add to what you listed? Well, that was a really great list. Um, anything you want to add? And Margie, um, do you have anything you yeah. want to add? Oh, did you want to okay. um, I would just add, um, I think a lot of times we automatically go to those bruises. And um, there's a, a sheet up here. Uh, it's actually on the back of the reproductive coercion sheet. And I encourage all of you to grab that. There's some direct and indirect questions that you can ask. Um, as a routine screening. Um, but those bruises that you talked about, I really want to uh, touch base that there's 
more than those bruises that are happening, right? Domestic violence is more than that physical. But some of the things that you might see as healthcare professionals um, are bruises that are happening um, at different times, healing at different times. Um, you might see defensive wounds. So if you think of defensive wounds, um, somebody might put their hands, up. this is really hard to do holding a mic, but somebody might put their hands up, you might see bruises along their arms, bruises on their back from running away. You also might see bruises um, in areas um, where they may put clothes on, so areas in the genitals. Um, we'll see bruising there. Mm -hmm. Anything else you guys can add? Can, oh, I have, you don't have a mic, sorry. <laughs> um, can I, say, I just say something about sexual assault? Um, if Really, the focus is on consent, right? And consent is an enthusiastic yes. It's, it's, it's not when somebody is coerced or manipulated or giving in to pressure or incapacitated. So if they're drunk or, or under some other, under the influence of some other kind, um, where they're not acting like themselves um, or passed out, they can't give consent. So I think that the example we gave, you know, well, I, they're not forcing me. Sometimes we think of force as physical force, again, with the physical, but oftentimes it's words, it's, it's manipulation. That's how people use their power to take advantage of someone in this way. So we're, we're thinking about um, those kinds of things. And if that person freely said, yes, I want to do this, um, that might be what we're looking for with a sexual assault. Do you have a need to add? Um, just that in uh, the cases of uh, sexual assault and domestic violence, it often is important to listen to the victim to also um, help the victim get the support. I know that's been mentioned. And as far as mandated report, reporting in the state of Maine, it's children, vulner, vulnerable adults, teens, and um, elders, that, and, and adults that are in a domestic um, violence situations, if they fail to um, make a report, or if the police are not called and these things go unrecognized and are perpetuated. One of the other things I oh, <laughs> one of the other things I hear from healthcare professionals is um, a lot of um, missed appointments um, or appointments canceled by their partner or their partner showing up to appointments with them, um, dropping them off and sitting in the waiting room or asking to be in the examination room with them. We're trying to engage you as professionals to get involved, but I also want to say this is not your gig in the sense of you're not making decisions. You're still empowering somebody else. So you have this knowledge, you have connections, you can be a support, but it's not up to you whether that person should leave or not leave. It's not up to you whether they should call the police at that moment or the hotline. And I might be wrong, but through trainings that I've gone to, technically what I've learned as a doctor, the only thing that you're mandated to report is a gunshot wound in a domestic violence situation. So technically, somebody come in with a broken arm and tell you, I do not want to make a report. You do not have the right to go and call the police and not listen to them, because what they might be telling you is, if I call the police, I might be dead by tonight. So what they know is their abuser better than anyone else, and as much as you being compassionate and wanting to help, sometimes that is taking the lead of the person who knows the abuser the best, and that is the partner. Yeah, nicely said. So we'll go into um, a hotline call part two, is that all right? Anything we need to know? Uh, this is the follow-up call okay. from um, the last call where I got the number. All right, action. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, is Sarah in please? This is Sarah. Hi Sarah, this is Matthew from Family Crisis Services. I'm returning your call. How can I support you today? Yeah, thanks for returning the call. Um, I am actually a healthcare professional and uh, just wanted to, to talk about some concerns that I've been seeing with one of my patients, if that's okay. It definitely, thanks for calling. Yeah, so um, one of the things I ask all of my patients, do a routine screening with them, um, is I, I ask them if anybody's ever uh, hit them or threatened them or put them down or any tr control in their relationship um, because it is so common. Um, one of my patients that just left, um, she 
she so showed some real concerns um, of some extreme jealousy from her partner. Um, I followed up with that, um, asking, you know, what happens when that partner gets extremely jealous? Um, do they ever yell at you? Uh, she says that the partner's pretty good about yelling, um, not in front of the kids. But there was a one-time incident where, where the kids were involved, and, and they were really, really scared. Um, I'm not sure what you guys thought about it or, or what I should do about it. Well, uh, first, I just want to uh, thank you for, because what I heard you say is that you have routine screening questions, and I think that is so important uh, that you do that, because I don't know if you would have gotten this information if you did not provide that platform for the, your patient to be able to talk to you. So I just, I want to commend you, and I'm glad that you have that for all your patients. And then I also like that you had follow-up questions that you got an answer uh, to one of the questions that made you think and were concerned or a red flag, and you asked a follow-up question to to get more information or provide that opportunity for them to share more information. And so what I heard when you did that is that she talked about yelling or screaming. So did she talk about the screaming as something that was scary for her or frightening? Did she, was, was she... Um, she seemed more scared for the children. Um, she knew that the children didn't hear all the time or said that the children didn't hear all the time. She said that they were in their rooms. My concern is that the children are still hearing. Um, so, but she is, she's definitely scared for herself and, and for the children. Hmm. And I, I'm not in that house, so I don't know what is happening and what has, has happened or hasn't happened, but what I have learned is, is that often pe mothers especially will say that the, the abuse didn't happen in front of the children. What I know is if the children are in the house, they are witness to it, that there is energy within the house, that they can tell, that they understand how the tones are, they know how when it gets real loud and then whispering, that uh, even infants are capable of taking in this energy. So I am glad uh, that she is thinking about the children, but I also just wanted to know if you were aware of that factor, um, had looked at or would like to know any more about children witnessing domestic violence. Yeah, I mean, I, I am aware of it, but not, um, don't know too much, so I would definitely ha love more information if you had that. Um, and I'm just, I'm concerned, you know, it was great that I could have these routine questions that I've been trained to ask, but uh, not really sure what to do now. Like, what are the next steps? Um, I think uh, bringing back information, and it sounds like, uh, does she know that you were calling the hotline? Yeah, I asked her and, um, if she wanted to, and, and she asked me to call for her. Very good. I'm glad that you asked that. You could have called me even if she said no, but not give me any information just to help you. But since she, you can say then that some of the information you got uh, was about our services. Mm -hmm. Do you, does she, is she aware of family crisis services or do, do you know if she's aware of family crisis services? I don't think she's ever worked with you guys in the past and I, I'm not sure she's, I, I gave her the hotline number, but um, I don't have too much more to offer her from your services. Do you have any brochures at, at your office about oh, our... Oh, you know, we probably do uh, in the exam rooms and, and probably some in the waiting rooms. Well, it just, um, again, she might not want to take it because it might not feel safe, but showing her what the services are and allowing her to pick and choose what services are there. Uh, she might feel safe calling a hotline instead of meeting one-on-one. -on -one. I have found that some people would rather meet one-on-one -on -one instead of talk on the hotline. So our outreach offices are available that she can contact either the hotline to set that up or directly those offices, which will be in that brochure. And um, just also information sometimes, I think, uh, is key because a lot of times survivors think it's their fault or they brought it on. And I think sometimes starting and it just helping people understand what abuse is and that no one asks to be abused and no one deserves to be abused. And to say that if you indeed are concerned for her, Tell her that. Uh, what I know is that people, when someone of a profession who has authority, who says, I'm concerned for you, there is something that is different than a neighbor even saying, I'm concerned for you. Um, and also, I have found with uh, it's studies with moms, if you say that you are concerned for their children because of the violence that you heard or the uh, witnessing, that they might more apt 
to actually take steps to to because they think that their children are being hurt opposed to taking steps for themselves sometimes they will feel that they'll sacrifice themselves if they their emotional or physical state if they feel that they are saving the children from that but if they are understanding that what really happens they might make different choices great i'll definitely tell her that um matthew i made a another appointment follow-up appointment with her next week and she asked if it, somebody from your agency could come and meet with her next week at the appointment do you think we could do that I would um, call the uh, outreach office. I would encourage her. At some point, she's going to at least need to engage uh, and have that conversation and say that she would like to meet. And then they would work hard on, on making that coordinated uh, meeting. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Good luck. Nice. 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 So a couple things I'd like you to take away. One is that nobody dies from asking the question, what's the worst that will happen? What is the worst that will happen? They'll be upset. They'll be mad at you. Maybe hit you close to home. But what is the worst will happen? And I think that just remembering that this is, you have power. You have, and you referred to that in this last um, exchange here, that you as healthcare providers have power to validate. And that is not a small thing. So I, I hope you use that power to the, to the good. Um, one of your professors had something to say, and I wanted, I told her I would repeat it, and let me come over here as well. And she said, um, it's not what is wrong with you, but it's what happened. That's another question. There are some great national resources. If you Google um, healthcare professions and domestic violence, the uh, Futures Without Violence has free tools that are amazing with like checklists and great questions, and it's all at your Google fingertips. Um, you wanted to say something. I actually have two questions. The first one is, children who are abused um, in their youth, do they grow up to be abusers themselves? Is there any data on that? And then the other question is, do abusers ever get help? Or is it kind of like, is that something that you see? Um, the I don't have the stat right in front of me, but there is a high proportion of individuals who were uh, witnessed abuse as a child that uh, choose later on. And that's not because it's hereditary or through osmosis, <laughs> it's through socialization. It's through uh, uh, abuse as a learned behavior. So you have a greater chance of thinking that's normalized if you indeed see it at, in your home. But that doesn't mean that you're going to uh, end up being an abuser. My parents smoked four packs of cigarettes. I did not smoke. My younger brother does. And, it's, uh, and we came from the same household. We, it was not predetermined whether we would smoke or not, but it's a learning and what is normalized. So I think it's important to uh, recognize that it's a choice. And because it's a choice, that and people can change all the time. But you cannot mandate change. You cannot even jail change out of someone. It's something that they want to do. They need to recognize that what I've been doing is wrong, and if I continue to do it, I am going to lose all the things that I think that I love in this world. And that is the only time that uh, change will happen is when an individual makes change themselves. Yeah, one of the good resources is an organization called Emerge in uh, Massachusetts, and I think they've got some of the better materials out there as well. So it's, um, there is no magic wand and there is no hoping and waiting. It's got to be on someone's own initiative for sure. Um, other final thoughts, questions? Grace. I just want to say thank you to all of you who put posters together, and you may take them with you if you want to, or you can leave them with me, whatever you prefer. And there'll be a small group discussion on October 31st at noon. It's a Thursday. I don't know the location yet, but I'll be bothering people via email. Uh, it's, a big com it's a big group to have a conversation. If you had a question you weren't comfortable asking but wanted to do it in a smaller conversation, so watch for October 31st. We'll have a small. You have resources on campus. You have resources at your fingertips and they want to say something, so we should look some of that. I just want to say one more thing, something that we didn't model in our, um, our calls, 
is that this might bring some stuff up for you. So if uh, Sarah was calling and um, I might check in with her also and just say, how are you doing? This is a really, that's a really heavy thing to hear from one of your patients and you're just doing a routine thing with them. Um, you know, how, how are you doing? What are you doing to take care of yourself? So I, I encourage you all to think about those things as well. Um, what are you doing to take care of yourself and understand that we are here for you also. I just wanted to add that. I'm in. really glad you did. That was one of the final points we wanted to make. And you may think you're fine, but are you fine? And are you behaving in a way that is serving your client? So if you have a predetermined judgment or stuff from your own childhood or your own experience, that can color either the absence of violence and abuse or the presence of it in your life. It's just a factor and a variable. And the funny thing about trauma is that um, it pops up. And you may think all's well and this is good, but trauma pops up. And so noticing and having a self-care space for recognizing when you are triggered is really, really important. And I'm glad that we had a, a modeling of a healthcare provider stepping in and asking for some assistance. So, oh, we got a hand. Go. Um, I just had a question as a healthcare provider. If someone, um, like a patient, approaches you, but then, like, for, like, Sarah, if they didn't want you to um, call a hotline, do you have to call or do you have to report it somehow if they just wanted to, like, talk to you about it or do you have to reach out to somebody else? Um, so you don't have to call, um, but you also can call. So just because, like Matthew said, just because um, your patient says, no, I don't want to call and I don't want you to call on my behalf, you can always do hypotheticals. I get majority of the hotline calls that I get, I have no idea who that person's talking about. Um, but you can say, hey, hypothetically, if I had a patient say this, what are some things we could offer them? What could I say back? Um, and how would that look? So you don't have to call, no, but we would hope that you would want to call. Um, so you could get some language around how to respond to that person and what you can offer them. Um, there are electronic medical records issues in making, um, making uh, direct verbatim quotes. Um, in the record is really important in not interpreting what happened or supposing what happened, but actually having your record be there. It's really important because there's a network of people treating this person and um, they all kind of need to have this information in some way. In the old days, I understand from somebody with children that they were worried about child abuse, they would put stickers little smiley faces on the folders and the smiley face was a, a flag. So maybe your records um, that you're going to be working with have some way to flag that um, in there. Um, there's another, another point in there. Um, if you are not writing it down, you're not serving your person well at all. And if you are supposing, it, you can write, I patient did not disclose, but I suspect because. Um, and so you are framing it and owning it as an opinion rather than a, uh, a remark. But people bounce all the time. I hear people getting fired from um, their uh, providers because they've missed three appointments or something and we've got, a, we've got too many people, we don't have time. But that can be sometimes um, what is being used as power control against them. So it's complicated. It's really complicated. Um, Kathy, can I add one thing please. too? Um, so you can offer to call. We, we did this as a provider calling on behalf of their patient. You can call with that patient um, if you want or have that patient call. Sometimes giving that hotline number, um, we hear from that person a month later. So at that time, they didn't want you to call. They didn't want to call. They want nothing to do with this. But having that number... Um, for them to call later was really important. So uh, one of the things that I always recommend whenever I'm training with healthcare professionals is taking the gray cards, and I know SARSM has some um, brochures and pamphlets, but something that you can leave in the bathroom of wherever you're serving. Um, that's somewhere private that they can stick it in their shoe or in their bra, wherever they need to, um, to keep it safe. We have hopefully whetted your appetite for how much there is to know. And thanks you, to Brian. A nice thank you, Brian, Brian, for your work today. Thank you all. Go forth and heal. <laughs> Take care.